All right. Welcome, everyone. I'm excited we have such a great turnout today. For those who have not met me yet, my name is Tess King. I'm one of the inpatient chief residents here, so I'm excited to uh, be hosting our first Grand Rounds of March. Can't believe that it's the spring already. Uh, we have a couple different things happening today. We have a Grand Rounds talk, but before we get into that, I, I want to introduce Dr. Nisha Bonsal, who will be uh, giving a, a brief intro for the Dr. William Bremner Endowed Mentorship Award. I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Bunsel. Great, thank you, Dr. King. Um, it's my absolute privilege to be here representing the Department of Medicine Mentorship Committee in presentation of this year's William J. Bremner Endowed Mentorship Awards. Um, Department of Ment Medicine here um, values mentorship. We recognize that mentorship is critical to success across all phases of faculty's careers in academic medicine. And these awards were established in 2015 to honor faculty members for their contribution to the scientific, educational, and patient care mission of the department through exemplary mentorship. And I just want to give a shout out to the incredible members of the mentorship committee who helped select this year's um, outstanding recipients. And so our recipients of this year's mentorship awards are Dr. Randall Curtis from the Depart Division of Pulmonary Critical Care and Sleep Medicine, who's receiving the award for excellence in mentorship of physician scientists, and Dr. Sharisha Donny Reddy, a professor of allergy and infectious disease, who's receiving the award for excellence in mentorship of clinician scholars and full-time clinical faculty. And the nomination packets for these two incredible faculty members were extensive and there were so many accolades, but I just wanted to highlight some of the quotes that were submitted on behalf of both Dr. Curtis and Dr. Donnie Reddy. Um, and here for Dr. Curtis, you can see um, statements included, his passion for research is only matched by his enthusiasm for mentoring. His love in research and teaching is contagious. I've been astounded by his poise, grace, and guidance as a mentor. He inspires his mentees to challenge themselves. And I love this last quote, and it was actually from Randy himself during an interview. You know, individual papers, I love them. I should probably love them all. But the people that have, but the people have been more important to me, the people that I've mentored and what they can go on to accomplish. I've always felt that's what's most important. Next slide, please. And then I'd like to include a few, um, also recognize the incredible um, nominations that were submitted on behalf of Dr. Donnie Reddy. She was um, lauded as a natural mentor, an exceptional role model for trainees and junior faculty. Her clinical prowess is unparalleled and unassuming. She continuously models the principles of social justice in every patient interaction. Um, through her mentorship, it was the first time I felt that I was an expert in something. She always finds time to advocate for her mentees despite her numerous responsibilities. And anyone who has worked with Sharisha becomes a better doctor and patient advocate. So um, thank you both to Dr. Curtis and Dr. Donnie Reddy for their incredible mentorship and their contribution to the Department of Medicine. Um, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Bremner, um, the namesake of this award, who's also gonna say a few comments. Thanks very much, Nisha, and <clears throat> hello everyone. I was really thrilled uh, when Nisha informed me several weeks ago that the Mentorship Awards Committee had chosen Sharisha and Randy for this year's awards. I've known both our awardees since they were in our medicine residency program and have greatly admired their work over the intervening years. Their outstanding work by Sharisha in infectious diseases, patient care and teaching, and by Randy in end of life care and palliative care have really provided excellent venues for training of their many, many mentees. And their mentees in turn have gone on to their own impressive successful careers. In a sense, both of our awardees have provided instruction and mentorship to all of us in recent times, Sarisha in relation to the pandemic, including her influential public service statements and Randy and his very moving discussions and publications concerning how he is dealing with his personal health challenges. Our department and our profession will be much the better for generations to come because of the wonderful mentorship provided by these two outstanding individuals. So warmest congratulations, Sharisha and Randy, for these extremely well-deserved awards. We're all certainly very proud of you. So I think now I should turn it over to Randy for some comments.
I am going to use this text-to-speech technology because I have lost my ability to speak due to bulbar onset ALS. I would like to thank the committee and the department for this important award. This award is particularly meaningful to me for two reasons. First, mentoring has been one of the most important and rewarding parts of my career. When I think about my professional legacy, I really think first and foremost about the people I have mentored and their wonderful accomplishments. Second, this award is also very meaningful to me because Bill Bremner was a very important mentor of mine and having this award named after him is a great honor. In my time as a chief resident under his leadership at the VA, I learned a tremendous amount about how to be an outstanding leader and mentor. So, thank you all and especially thank you, Bill. Thank you so much, Dr. Curtis, and congratulations again. Um, you're most deserving of this recognition. And I'd like to hand it over to Dr. Donnie Reddy for some comments as well. Well, it's always tough to follow Randy. Um, and as I emailed him when we both found out, um, I'm just honored to be even mentioned in the same way as Randy Curtis. Um, I am. Um, I feel very honored to get this award. I have had the benefit of having amazing mentorship throughout my career and also the opportunity to work with amazing mentees that have made this job of mentoring much easier. Um, and I look forward to working with people throughout my career. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Donnie Reddy, um, for everything you do for the Department of Medicine. We're so grateful. Congratulations to both our winners. All right. I will now hand it back over to Dr. King. Excellent, thank you so much. There are lots of congratulations coming in through our chat. Uh, well, I, without further ado, I will bring it to our Grand Rounds talk today. And I, I'm excited that we have uh, both our award recipients and such a great turnout today. So thank you all for joining. I uh, wanna take a moment to just remind everyone, please do post any questions you have into our chat. And at the end, I'll be moderating a question and answer session with our speakers. And um, before we get going, let me just introduce our Grand Rounds talk. So the talk today is working towards gender equity in the UW Department of Medicine. And our two speakers are Dr. Susan Merrill, who is an associate professor in general internal medicine and an associate clerkship director and education director of the Cambia Palliative Care Center of Excellence. She's also a faculty co-chair of the Gender Equity Council. Our second speaker today is Kelsey Griffin, who is an operations manager in the Division of Gastroenterology and a staff co-chair of the Gender Equity Council as well. So thank you so much for being here, both of you. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Dr. King. So this is a speech in honor of Women's History Month and women's history is a people's history, right? It's the history of individual women. Uh, Kelsey and I are women in medicine. We're not famous women in medicine. So we're gonna start by telling you our history and how it worked how it relates to our interest in gender equity. So uh, my father is a retired psychiatrist. My mother is an artist. I was one of those girls who thought that I was bad at science and math. I majored in women's studies. Uh, there's a picture there of a rather baby faced me at my graduation. And I recently found the program from my uh, undergraduate thesis in women's studies, which was about the role of African-American women in the civil rights movement. I actually worked in the labor movement for a few years. Uh, that's my close friend, Meg Nimi there uh, wearing our matching union t-shirt. She's now a leader in the labor movement in Oregon. Um, many of you know me as a medical educator in geriatrics and palliative care. I was inspired to go into uh, geriatrics by older adults, such as my great uncle Joe, whose picture is there. And because we're going to be talking about uh, women physician and staffs with families, I'm going to introduce you to my family, my husband, Roel, um, our older son, uh, Sam, who was born when I was in medical school and is now living his best liberal arts life at Oberlin College. And uh, our son, Jordan, who is uh, it, born when I was in geriatrics fellowship. And then Kelsey is going to tell us about her. Hi, yes, thank you. Um, I'm Kelsey. I have been with gastroenterology for nine years. I'm originally from Monroe, Washington. I'm sure you've driven through it to get to Stevens Pass. Um, at around the age of 12, my mom got a job with the U.S. government that moved us to Frankfurt, Germany. I was there for six years through high school, um, ended up coming back to Washington to Ellensburg to go to school 
and it was um, a bit of a culture shock. So I immediately signed up to get back to Europe, studied in London, followed my mom to her next job in Korea for a little bit, and then did end up back here in Seattle. I do think um, these opportunities I was afforded to live abroad and travel really spurred my interest in, in people and cultures and, and um, sociology and, and sociology of gender has always been something that I have been passionate about and um, continue to study. I currently live in Beacon Hill with my partner, Mike. That's him up there. Uh, he actually works at uh, Mary's Place, which is a shelter for women and children and families. And so supporting women in, in multiple different avenues is big in our household. Um, and then I just wanted to add a couple local feminists to Seattle, West and Alua. They're um, native to South Seattle and I've seen them speak and read their books. And I've actually run into them a couple times at different local spots in the area. And I, I really think it humanizes their work and kind of makes it seem like feminists, they're just like us. So um, look them up if you're interested. Thank you so much, Kelsey. Oops. So I'm gonna give some definitions. First of all, we've already used the word women. Um, when I say women or woman, I mean anybody who identifies as a woman, including trans women. Gender equi equality, which some people could would argue that we have because uh, medical schools are now about 50% women, is providing equal opportunities for men and women. This talk is about gender equity, which I don't think we have yet. Gender equity involves correcting the historical wrongs that have left women behind. It includes structural change, culture change, and recognition of our own biases. And I'll add that successful movements for gender equity need to consider other uh, systemic inequities like those around race, class, and sexual orientation. So just briefly uh, for Women's History Month, a uh, brief uh, history of women physicians in the US. I think it actually does give some important context to some of the things we're gonna talk about today. So as you probably know, the first woman physician was Dr. Elizabeth Blackwell in 1849. The first African-American woman physician uh, graduated in 1864, uh, Rebecca Crumpler. Uh, both Dr. Blackwell and Dr. Crumpler uh, dedicated their lives to caring for underserved people. Dr. Crumpler cared for freed slaves. Um, however, it wasn't at all a steady increase in women in, uh, as physicians after that. In fact, the Flexner Report, which uh, standardized med medical education, decreased the number of women in medicine because the women-only medical schools were closed. There were quotas limiting women in medicine, limiting other groups in medicine too, up until the early 1970s. It took Title IX, and class action suits, we had to sue the medical schools in order for more women to get in. Um, there then was a rapid rise, or there then was a significant rise. Uh, the first woman dean was Dr. Leah Lowenstein. Uh, the first African-American woman dean was Dr. Uh, Barbara La Ross Lee. Now, uh, in the US, women are 50% of medical school graduates, 35% of the physician workforce, underrepresented in many specialties. Uh, 25% uh, professors, less than 20% of deans and department chairs, only 12% of women chairs are underrepresented minorities, which I'll abbreviate as URM during this talk. So where are we in terms of gender inequities in medicine in the United States? What do we know from the national literature? In terms of promotion and leadership, only about 15% of deans are women. In a New England Journal study, which many of you have probably seen, between 1979 and 2018, women academic physicians were like less likely to be promoted to associate professor, full professor, department chair. And this gap did not narrow over time when they compared the cohort up to 1997 with the later cohort. Other STEM fields have narrowed this gap, but we have not. Why is this? Well, I'm a geriatrician, so I'm used to saying that things are multifactorial, right? It's definitely societal, not all on medicine. Um, and there are a lot of things going on. Um, and some of these things are improving, but we just haven't caught up. But uh, uh, just to, to name a few, uh, women have had fewer opportunities to speak nationally. We are less likely to get awards, had been less likely to get awards from professional societies. Women have fewer publications, especially first author publications. And a recent study found that women uh, were more likely to discuss authorship in advance, but also experience 
authorship disagreements and feel devalued. What do we know nationally in terms of compensation? The physician gender pay gap is the largest of any profession. We are behind the CEOs and the financial services, or we are worse than, our gap is worse than the CEOs and the financial services people. Women uh, in a recent study were estimated to earn $2 million less than men over a career after adjustment. And certainly, there are other compensation inequities in medicine, especially by race, but gender uh, is the primary factor driving compensation inequities. So you'll see here, uh, if, you, uh, if, if, white men, if white male physicians earn a dollar, uh, women physicians of different races earn 77 cents or less. Why is this? Again, multifactorial for sure, and many of it is societal. But just briefly from the New England Journal article, um, our base salaries may be lower because of uh, decreased ability to, or because of decreased negotiation or a negotiation penalty. Um, productivity uh, may be lower because of domestic duties, organizational service. We spend more time with patients that has, has been studied, uh, uh, which is good, but um, leads to decreased productivity. Um, leadership premium, many women don't get this because they don't have formal leadership opportunities. Um, rank and sen seniority, uh, fewer promotions, which we'll talk about quite a bit. Moving on to talk about what do we know nationally about the problem of bias, harassment, microaggressions, macroaggressions um, against mostly uh, women physicians is, is the data. So um, a national study uh, using a sampling procedure, uh, categorize six common types of uh, aggressions, micro and macro, overt sexism, pregnancy and childcare related bias, having our abilities underestimated, encountering sexually inappropriate comments, being relegated to mundane tasks, and feeling excluded or marginalized. A national survey of academic hospitalists um, showed that 72% of women reported inappropriate touch sexual remarks or suggestive looks from patients. 18% reported that from colleagues. Women in this study rated their sense of being respected both by patients and colleagues as lower than men, and that was statistically significant. And 99% uh, of women in this study reported being mistaken for a non-physician healthcare worker as compared to 29% of men. And I wanna unpack that just for a minute because I have tremendous respect for my nurse and pharmacist colleagues um, and in no way are insulted if uh, uh, I am mistaken for a pharmacist, the pharmacists are way, the clinical the pharmacists are way smarter than me. Um, but uh, I, I really wonder about uh, the physician patient relationship if I've spent a lot of time as somebody's doctor explaining the plan, and then I find out that they didn't even realize that there was their doctor. And I also wanted to um, point out that in this study, while it was a pretty racially diverse sample of physicians, they didn't tell us the race of the uh, male physicians who experienced uh, uh, this also. And I know that this happens to male physicians of color as well. One last uh, form of bias I wanted to uh, highlight here. This is mostly from the education literature, and this is definitely or primarily unconscious bias uh, from really well-meaning people who are writing evaluations for medical students or other trainees and writing letters of recommendation for women faculty. And this is very much societal and, and what we've learned, how we've learned to talk about men and women. But um, there's pretty good evidence that uh, men in all levels of medicine, um, when uh, we write evaluations or letters about them, they are described with competency-related behaviors, advanced, knowledgeable, or standout behaviors, exceptional, best, outstanding. And um, women are more likely described as, as cheerful, delightful, lovely, um, or with grindstone adjectives, organized, hardworking, uh, diligent. Um, there are similar studies uh, that show similar uh, changes for white versus underrepresented minority trainees and faculty. Um, I bring this up uh, uh, partly because this is a modifiable uh, behavior. Uh, shout out to Lon Nguyen in um, the sub-internship program who helps me edit our 
uh, comments for gender and race bias. And um, there are a couple of us in the department who would be willing to speak to your uh, division or education group about this more if this is not a dialogue that you've had in your division. So um, finishing up the national section of my talk um, with a review of what do we know about uh, uh, what do we know about interventions that might help us move towards gender equity in medicine in the United States. So uh, like the good scientists we are, the Gender Equity Council looked at, we did a big literature search and we looked at uh, systematic reviews and uh, reviewed a lot of studies. And unsurprisingly, that because this is a big problem and perhaps not very well funded, there aren't a lot of high quality studies that look at promotion, leadership, and retention as outcomes. There's a lot of great studies defining the problem. There's a lot of great studies reporting small interventions. Um, uh, from my review, um, mentoring and peer mentoring, to get back to the, the theme of today, are likely a really important part of the solution. And then the work of Dr. Molly Carnes including the bias reduction and in internal medicine program that our institution is uh, participating in, um, has some really positive outcomes, uh, including increased hiring of women and other outcomes. While there haven't been a lot of really large studies for certain outcomes, there's a lot of smart people thinking about this problem. And so there's a lot of good expert recommendations out there. I'm gonna just list some of them transparency and routine assessment of the equity of compensation, establishing institutional support for family responsibilities, improving mentoring for women, proactively nominating women for awards and speaking opportunities, and tasking promotion committees with ensuring proportionate promotion of women. So I talked about the national scene in terms of gender equity, and um, here's what we know from our year of investigation as the Gender Equity Council into the state of gender equity in the Department of Medicine. And I'm gonna talk about representation, promotion, compensation, leadership, bias and harassment, mentorship, and support for families. So what do we know about just the numbers? Um, so women are 55% of our total faculty of 1,258. We're 88% of teaching associates, 48% of other faculty titles. Um, we are underrepresented in the regular faculty. Only 43% of regular faculty is compared to 55% of clinical faculty. In terms of promotion, women are overrepresented in acting instructor, clinical instructor, assistant and acting assistant roles. We're about half of associate professors. We're about 28%, we're 28% of full professors, 20% of clinical professors, and that's similar to the national data. Promotions to associate occur uh, at about the same time and rank for men and women. Um, to professor, uh, women do take longer. Um, I think a bigger problem is, is probably just not getting there. If you're curious about how your division is doing around the mean of 28%, uh, I have here the four divisions that are above the mean, which all currently happen to be happen to have uh, women as division heads, whether that's cause or effect, I don't know, because historically, most uh, division heads have been full professors. I, I, I also was wondering, as you may be, is this, is this improving? Have we made progress in terms of the promote, promote, excuse me, the proportion of faculty promoted to full professor who are women. And looking at this graph, I would say, unfortunately, no. We had a very good year in 2009, and we didn't do too bad in 2021, but we'll have to see uh, how we improve. So moving on to what we know about compensation here at the University of Washington and the Department of Medicine. So, um, and so first, just to uh, lay out how our salaries are determined. So we have a base salary, which is negotiated at hiring. We have supplements for leadership or extra uh, clinical or education work. We have merit raises. Um, some divisions have incentives. Once hired, there's a limited uh, number of ways that your salary can increase, promotion, merit raises, retention raises, 
uh, a unit adjustment when inequity is found. Equity reviews are done at the School of Medicine level every three years by the Associate Dean for Faculty Affairs, currently Dr. Trish Critic. Uh, the last review for the Department of Medicine was in 2020, and like all the reviews for the other uh, departments, looked at title, years, and rank, base salary, tenure, and gender. No systemic inequities were identified. However, mean base and total compensation by rank supplements were not compared, um, so it's not um, exactly the same review that the AAMC does. If there are any um, inequities, uh, which are not systemic, or if we do find any uh, inequities in the, in the future, um, some reasons for that might be just a divisional difference in salaries and divisional difference in the gender breakdown, um, negotiation for initial salary, differences in who's in a leadership role and who gets other kinds of supplements, and potentially in who gets merit raises. I don't I don't know if there is a gender difference in who gets merit raises, but it would be one way that salaries could be inequitable. Um, of note, uh, the department does not control certain things like salaries at the VA or the Hutch or hospital supplements. Moving on to the topic of leadership, how are we doing with leadership? I would say we're doing pretty good with leadership. Dr. Barbara Young is the first woman named department chair in our 70 year history. The first woman named division head was Dr. Ginny Brody, who was the interim head of hematology, followed by uh, Dr. Abkowitz, head of hematology in 2006. And we make really uh, a lot of good progress uh, in terms of women in division head roles. This has increased steadily, and you'll see the blue line is women and the orange line is men. And we're now um, just with recent hires uh, above 50%, so that's great news. Moving on to what do we know about bias, harassment, and burnout in the Department of Medicine, and we don't have staff-specific data about that. Um, this is data from the uh, Diversity Committee survey uh, in the spring of 2019. In that survey, 19% of faculty and 13% of trainees surveyed observed or experienced inappropriate comments regarding gender in their unit three or more times in the past year. 30% of faculty and 50% of trainees reported inappropriate behaviors or comments regarding gender from a patient three or more times in the past year. And while that's an unfortunate number, it's similar or lower than national data. 15% uh, of faculty and 5% of trainees reported witnessing or experiencing unwelcome sexual innuendo or behavior in a faculty member at least once in the past year. There were very few people who reported any more than that. And lastly, Faculty and trainees identifying as women were more likely to report microaggressions and burnout with an odds ratio around two for the faculty and higher than that for the trainees. Moving on to mentorship and um, the wonderful work of Dr. Bonsall and the mentorship committee. We didn't do a separate mentorship survey for women, but they included gender in their analysis. So this was a survey of faculty in the fall of 2020. 34% of their respondents reported not having a mentor and wanting one, and the majority were women, 60% uh, uh, mid-career clinical faculty. Of note in that survey, they asked what people were looking for in a mentor and how they wanted to get a mentor, and respondents felt that personality, career trajectory, and reputation were important in mentor choice but that gender, race, and sexual orientation were not important factors, so women didn't necessarily feel that they needed to be mentored by another woman. The majority of respondents wanted to work with leadership to identify a mentor, uh, as opposed to being totally on their own to identify a mentor, or on the other end, being strictly assigned a mentor. Moving on to what do we know about our experiences uh, at, in support for families in the Department of Medicine. So um, the Gender Equity Council is doing a focus group study of faculty, staff, teaching associates, and trainees regarding a shared mental model of support for families. So we just finished the focus groups. Um, we did a confidential Zoom hour-long focus groups and asked people what's their experience of 
um, feeling like their family life is supported at work, and what would be our shared mental model if we aimed to do that. And we haven't uh, analyzed the data yet, but I do have a couple of anonymous quotes to share with you. One person said, I've had a few different family emergencies and every division has a different way of dealing with emergent requests for time off. And it can be extremely intimidating to ask your colleagues to cover for you, especially if your emergency is happening at a challenging time. Another person said loss of time for early career people is brutal. And I've definitely seen like very different trajectories Young men with no family shooting ahead where women with families, you know, lag behind. A lot of this is not specific to the University of Washington. A lot of this is the culture of medicine, right? One person said, we inculcate that into our residents and junior faculty and staff, this concept of self-sacrifice. And we sometimes wear that as a mantle of martyrdom, as a moment of pride. Look at how hard I'm working. Look at everything that I'm doing. But we're doing that at the expense of our families. And I had to include this quote, one person said, I just have to say, learning how to manage a two-year-old is intensely useful in one's work life. I also had to include this quote because I think it demonstrates the value of talking about these issues in a safe space. One participant said, I don't know how many other institutions are having these focus groups. So this gave me some hope actually. Just the fact that we are talking about it, I don't know what can come of this, but I hope change can be made. And just the fact that we're talking about it is a big first step. So I'm now gonna turn um, it over to Kelsey to talk about what does gender equity mean for staff in the Department of Medicine? Great, thank you. So uh, looking at gender equity and staff in the DOM, I kind of wanted to give a larger picture of what what UW is and what our staff is made up of. Uh, so we're quite large on all of our campuses. We've got over 26,000 staff members, of which the Department of Medicine has nine around 900 staff. Um, staff types range from administrative to research, clinical, um, facilities, IT. I could go on. We have a, a huge, huge diverse type of uh, staff there, and they're falling into two different categories. It's, it's classified staff which is, uh, can be union and pro staff, which is usually non-union. So all of these factors combined that we're so large, that we have so many di different types of staff, that we're a state institution really can complicate things and make things a little bit hard to manage on our divisional level. So um, our staff, like other academic institutions, is predominantly identifying as women. Um, in the DOM or in the UW as a whole, it's over 66%. And in the DOM, it's over 72%. Um, I did want to point out that um, the largest area is that classified staff, and then it gets much smaller at that pro staff grade 11 through 14, um, where it is going to be the management and leadership roles. And um, as you can see, the difference between men and women becomes much closer there at those higher level roles. So how, how do we look at gender then in the Department of Medicine? Um, what does this mean for us? So because the DOM staff is predominantly women, um, gender equity is really about promoting programs that will help all staff and then helping our, our women staff get to those leadership roles, to those, those, um, those higher paying uh, pro staff roles. So when we're thinking about it that way, I really wanted to look at retaining staff or understanding why staff is leaving. Um, I'm unaware of any um, recent data collected in the Department of Medicine of why staff is leaving, but I did do kind of an informal poll um, with my cohort, with my colleagues of why they think staff's leaving or also more importantly, why people are staying. We wanna make sure that we're amplifying these opportunities for our staff to stay or um, replicate them in other, in other ways. So um, a big reason why staff leaves, we all know we live in Seattle. Um, we've got a lot of competition here. It's Amazon, Microsoft. There's a ton of biotech firms that we're competing with that seemingly may have more job opportunities, um, potentially offer more uh, money. They might maybe be offering more growth. They've got um, a lot of shiny things that they can offer at staff to lure them away. Um, and then burnout. Burnout's huge. Burnout's big everywhere right now. Um, I don't need to go into it. People are leaving because they're tired of the job that they're doing, or they just don't want to work anymore for a while. That's another big reason why people are leaving, just taking a break. So um, when asking about why my staff, um, 
my staff colleagues have stayed. Mentorship was a big one. Um, I myself have benefited greatly from mentorship in the division and the departmental level. Um, I also um, had mentors that supported me to get opportunities that nominated me for things. Um, I started out as a um, temporary administrative coordinator. I helped out in fellowship programs. I've done different projects if I was interested. I'm speaking at DOM Grand Rounds. This is something that I, I've wanted to work on was my speaking skills and I have had the opportunity now to work on it. Um, so those opportunities um, are, are really important to make sure that we're giving staff. Um, I don't need to go into the details of the UW benefits, but they are fantastic. We all know a lot of people work here for, um, or because of the benefits. Um, and then value those who I, I did receive a lot of feedback that those who are staying it's because that they feel valued they think that their work their work is really important and they're hearing it from their colleagues and their um, managers so um, Susan will go into a couple of gen, uh, GEC recommendations that we put together for staff development in particular I did I did just want to talk about a few of the opportunities we already have right now in the department and um, through the school. Uh, pod classes, they're, they're fantastic. They're actually for faculty or staff. You can learn anything from Excel to bias training. Um, they're usually pretty quick and cheap, so definitely encourage those. Um, the DOM core competency series is fantastic. It's um, put on by DOM staff for DOM, DOM staff. It's usually bi-monthly or, or quarterly and it's topical issues um, that they think the staff would benefit from. Um, there is an official SOM mentorship program and, and you can volunteer to be a part of this as a mentor or to be a mentee and they pair you with um, individuals outside of your division or your department who can help guide you on hard conversations to have with your boss, um, asking for a raise, maybe putting together a resume for another job with a new dev that you're interested in. And then like I spoke before, the departmental um, and divisional mentorship that's already there. Um, and then also the, the staff recognition. So there's some staff recognition that you can um, nominate your staff for if, if you're interested. So um, I am now going to introduce the Gender Equity Council. Um, uh, it was established in 2020, at the end of 2020 by Dr. Young. Um, and it's a select group of volunteers that represent division, staff, faculty, and trainees. And, and we're all, um, uh, volunteer our time uh, once a month to meet and go through different initiatives uh, charged with making four recommendations uh, recommendations in these four areas uh, retention and career advancement employment family support and outreach and visibility and these were our uh, subcommittee chairs last year they put in a lot of work um, to help put together some initiatives and ideas of how we can uh, make a more equitable workplace um, and I did want to make sure that I um, call out Stephanie Tim, who was the staff co-chair last year. She did such a fantastic job. She really set the bar high. Um, she's still very involved, um, but uh, just wanted to make sure that she was acknowledged because she's wonderful. Um, and I will now pass back to Dr. Merrill to continue. Thank you so much, Kelsey. Um, so I'm now gonna present the Gender Equity Council recommendations from our inaugural year in the areas of retention and career advancement, employment, support for families, and outreach and visibility. And I'll note that Dr. Young um, has seen all these recommendations and is supportive, and we hope to implement them. We don't have a lot of details, we're just working that out. Uh, uh, and many of these will be incorporated into the strategic plan. So the first one under the category of retention and career advancement is to fund a new staff professional development grant program to give a little bit more uh, funding for opportunities for career advancement. The second one is directed towards a specific group of faculty, which is acting title faculty, um, because we want to make sure that, that there's equity in the use of these roles. We recommend looking uh, more into uh, retention data around women um, to shape for further recommendations around retention. And then we're proposing a pilot of one or more faculty review committees in a couple of select divisions. This is based on the experience at Emory in their division of GIM, which uh, greatly increased the percentage of women and underrepresented minority faculty who were promoted to both associate and full professor by using this process. 
It is an extra level of support, a, a kind of an interim review that's done by um, a, a third party who is not the division head or the person's individual mentor. And um, this would review all assistant professors at three years and associate professors at five years. Um, the goal would be to identify opportunities to support and recognize faculty that will help with promotion, resp recommend specific actions that the faculty member can take, and identify faculty members who might meet promotion metrics but might be slipping through the cracks. So we're still talking about this, but I think it's something that's worth a try in a couple of divisions. Moving on to recommendations around employment. We recommend continuing to do reviews of faculty salary equity, um, ideally um, a bit more in detail than they have been in the past. We recommend including staff in the next Department of Medicine uh, climate survey, implementing upcoming uh, recommendations for best practices in hiring. We spent a long time looking into what else uh, was being done at the School of Medicine level by the diversity committee. And there's a lot of uh, great stuff coming out at the School of Medicine level for best practices in hiring. So we aren't necessarily going to need to reinvent that wheel. Um, uh, similarly, um, while we definitely still have a long way to go, there has been a lot of work around reducing bias, harassment, aggressions in the system, um, including an upcoming Department of Medicine navigator program. So we take no credit for this. This is the Diversity Council and the DEI program. And Dr. Cabrera has allowed me to give you guys a little sneak peek. It will be coming out officially later in the spring. But this is a program that will allow faculty and staff to connect with a trained person when bias or mistreatment occurs. This person would be an outlet, a sounding board, and a resource not connected with official leadership or HR. Meetings are anonymous unless um, somebody chooses to go through with something where they can't be anonymous. And again, that's coming later this spring. Uh, uh, the next uh, category is support for families. And we wish we could do more around this. We would love it if we could help build a childcare facility, but we're just some volunteers. What we are doing is um, this focus group study to help de define this problem at the uh, Department of Medicine level and see if there are some internal solutions around this shared mental model. Lastly, our fantastic outreach and visibility uh, subcommittee led by Amy Fields has um, been doing a lot of great stuff. Uh, a gender equity lunch series, an ambassador program. We did a screening of the film Picture a Scientist, which you should see if you have not seen it. Hopefully you saw this week in your email that we're going to um, have gender equity awards, uh, which will recognize uh, faculty, staff, and trainees dedicated to the success of women and gender minorities, um, open for nominations due April 29th. Things that we did not do. I think we did a lot for a volunteer committee during a global viral pandemic. However, there were things that we did not get to do. Um, we did not look enough specifically into uh, issues affecting teaching associates and clinical faculty. We didn't look into harassment and bias specifically against department staff. Um, we didn't do anything around retention. And I think there's probably stuff going on um, in this area uh, in other departments that we don't know about yet. I'm going to end here with a call to action. Um, if you agree with me that we need to do work around gender equity, what can you as an indiv individual do to break this glass ceiling? So here's some things that anybody listening can do. We can mentor women and underrepresented minority faculty and trainees. We can get or stay engaged in equity work. We can study the problem and solutions. We can join a council. We can become a gender equity ambassador. We can educate ourselves. You can start or continue a dialogue in your division about equity. This has all been at the department level, but I think there's a, a really big role for working on this at the division level. A little bit more about mentorship. Mentoring, peer mentoring, sponsorship, coaching, collaboration with women and URM faculty and staff is something that we can all do. We can build our own diverse network of mentors, sponsors, coaches, collaborators, mentees. We can help build a culture of mentorship and mentorship structures within our divisions. So in thinking about this, I reflected on my own mentorship. Um, so I have a primary mentor, a wonderful primary mentor, Doug Powell. I hope he's in the audience today. I have wonderful 
project mentors, coaches, and sponsors, including Randy Curtis. I have uh, wonderful mentees and I get great joy from mentoring. I, I currently am all mentoring women. I, I definitely will, would mentor men and have in the past. The Susan Merrill Mentorship Shop is open for business. What I wanted to highlight is this uh, middle level um, as a uh, mid-career woman faculty member in a division without a lot of women full professors. I've uh, really enjoyed having a robust network of peers. And also on that list are uh, two women full professors, uh, Esther Chung from uh, uh, pediatrics and Sarah Kim from surgery, um, as well as people uh, within our uh, department who help me mentor uh, folks that are junior to me and who generally, I, I like to think we lift each other up. So I guess I'm saying, look at your own network and it increasing your network doesn't necessarily just need to mean a more established uh, uh, mentor or mentee relationship, but can be more expanded and um, uh, can be diverse. And certainly my network can be more diverse as probably everybody's can. Just going down the list of other things we can do, we can science this problem, right? And I just uh, showed a couple of uh, uh, titles here of work by department authors on uh, gender equity. So hopefully this will continue. Upcoming sessions, um, hopefully we'll have just a few minutes for questions at the end. Um, but if you have things that you'd like to discuss with the Gender Equity Council, we're doing a lunch session on March 10th. That'll be an informal uh, session where we can just talk to each other. And then there are a couple of other uh, uh, sessions coming up and um, uh, you can look on the website for that. You can become a gender equity ambassador. Uh, it's not that much work. It's just mostly a couple of extra emails and a little bit of dialogue. Um, uh, if you say you're going to be an ambassador, it means you're going to promote the work of the GEC in your division, share feedback and suggestions, um, promote gender equity on social media if, if you tweet or whatever. Um, so consider doing that. And I wish that I had room for pictures of all these fantastic people who participated in the GEC and in um, this year and last year. Um, this was a truly, truly the uh, a bright spot of the pandemic for me, which is which was working with all of these amazing people. Thank you very much. I, I guess we do have some time for questions here, and then. Uh, uh, please uh, feel free to reach out. I am on Twitter. Um, I look at my email. Uh, both of our emails are there. Thank you very much. This is a great talk. Thank you so much, both of you guys for presenting. Uh, there are a few questions in our chat and I, I just wanna start with a question uh, about the fact that you started with mostly data about medicine as a whole, not just the Department of Medicine and Internal Medicine. And I'm curious, um, Dr. Merrill, you mentioned a couple of times um, especially in your collaborator list, people that are in different departments, do you know of uh, how this data or this, this kind of finding is different or similar across other departments at UW or within medicine in general? Oh, in terms of, uh, has another department figured that out? I, I don't. Does yeah, or just are, the, are other people talking women? about it? <laughs> yeah, have a, other department, do other departments have more women full professors? That's that's um, a great idea. I don't. I don't know that. That is kind of on our list. Figuring out what other departments are doing. Yeah. Good question, Tess. Uh, another question that's coming in is, uh, what surprised you most from so far from the investigations and focus groups that you've done? Maybe to each of you. <laughs> I see that's Dr. Ralph asking that question. That's a really good question. Um, None of it surprised me very much <laughs> because I live this, right? So I think um, it wasn't, nothing was too much better or too much worse than I thought it would be. Um, again, just because I live this, but that's an excellent question, Dr. Ralph. Kelsey, can let you, surprised, yeah, yeah Kelsey, you too. the most? Yeah, um, I, I think I was pretty surprised about some of the feedback that's been received in the, the family support um, 
uh, group. I, I don't have kids. I, I don't support any family right now. So I'm not as engaged in that as, as much. So hearing that feedback, um, was valuable and scary. And, um, and I think it, that was eye opening for me at least. There's another question that I, I really love and want to highlight in the spirit of uh, my connection to the residents. And that's from Dr. McCormick. And he was asking, uh, particularly about Kelsey's data about staff feeling valued. How can we inspire recognition of our staff uh, and other disciplines uh, from particularly from trainees? How can we help them engage in uh, noticing and acknowledging when staff are doing a really great job? a great question. I, I think honestly, just hearing that they're doing it, I, it feels very simple. Just hearing that you're doing a good job is, is really a lot. Um, I, I, I hear it and it, I feel it. It also makes me want to work harder and um, it's, it builds a relationship too with, with other people in the division and the department. And I think that's really important. Um, Susan, did you have anything? I hope I understood the question. Correctly. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think Kelsey gave great ideas. I think in terms of trainees, it's part of it is just remembering if if we're faculty that that's really important and really connecting with people on an individual level and doing good, like taking the time to sit down with people and really talk to them. I think that the residency program uh, does some good work in this area as well. That's great. And I want to highlight something that uh, someone put into our chat as well. And uh, just promoting this idea for recognition of staff and really anyone, um, but sending letters or emails to people's supervisors can be a really great, uh, it doesn't take very long. And it is, I, I get them about residents all the time. Um, and it's, it's really wonderful to just hear great things that people are doing. Uh, and um, Dr. Merrill, I think there is a call out from our neurology friends and uh, department to get in touch with you to maybe do some yes, collaboration Yes, I already together. have a meeting set up with <laughs> Dr. Walster to, to collaborate with the neurologist. Perfect. I think we have a couple other questions coming in. We have a few more minutes. Yeah, I can, uh, I can see the questions. Do you want me to just answer some of them? Sure. Yeah, yeah go for so, it. So there's one, there's one here about um, Exiting faculty, exodus of mid-level and senior women faculty that is concerning. Does the department to reach out to do exit interviews? Um, I'm not aware of this. I know that uh, Dr. Young reached out with an idea from another institution about stay interviews, right? Reaching out now to people who are in a risk group for leaving. So this is um, the issue of um, retention is not something that we really took on, but we would uh, love to do that. And if you would like to help, please let us know because uh, we it's a big job. Um, another one, and we just have three minutes. Oh gosh, what is the number one reason health systems have not achieved gender equity in salaries given the data that is widely available? I wish that there was a number one reason Otherwise, because then we could just do it, right? Um, I think it's I think it's pretty complex, um, but I, I think that it is possible to achieve uh, gender equity. I think it's going to take work. Um, and then do I don't know. There's a lot of questions, and people will have to email us or come next week. Um, Oh yes, uh, Dr. Young is saying it. Part of it is inequity of specialty work in terms of uh, salaries. Um, somebody, there was a question from our about uh, medical students and uh, the need to move a lot during medical school training here, um, and how that can be disproportionately difficult for people who have children. Yeah, yeah, I'm looking at the question. Any student in the region has to move several times a year. How do we advocate for family support to allow women to be mothers and doctors? Uh, I, I, I think we have to model that partly because some of the support, some, not all, um, is available, but people don't ask for it. So we have to model as faculty that uh, we ask for support, but um, uh, uh, there probably also really do need to be 
uh, processes uh, within the medical school. I found that tough and I wasn't at a school where uh, I had to move around. Um, 